Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. After the little changeover, we're still going to get the, the hard line here. Uh, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Dan Fay. I work in the External Research and Programs Group and uh, responsible for the e-science kind of activities. I want to ch chat real briefly about the smart client piece and then, uh, as most of you folks know, there's a RFP that's going to be associated with this with regards to the um, uh, smart clients and e-science uh, piece. One of the things that's uh, really interesting about this space right now is, um, and you'll see some really great demos here, is um, you have an opportunity to create some really fantastic applications using distributed kind of uh, data sets and uh, uh, sources. And so you'll see some of that with the, the two demos and, and what uh, Rob's talking about, actually what smart clients are and giving some demos of what that means. So I don't want to take too much time, but um, thanks all for sticking through this afternoon. and. Uh, We'll, uh, well, if you have any questions about the RFP or the science part, please contact me. Otherwise, um, let's get going. Great. Can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, I'm Rob Barker. I'm a technical evangelist, and I work in the developer and platform evangelism group. So we're really uh, responsible for working with enterprises, customers, independent software vendors, and helping them understand the platform strategy in terms of the .NET framework, Microsoft Office, and really how to utilize those investments that we make uh, to build solutions on. I typically don't speak to, uh, to basically uh, faculty summits or anything like that. I typically speak at developer conferences and things of that nature. Uh, I'm, I like to be a fairly interactive speaker. I, I hate to just sit up here, do demos, do slides, and it'd be kind of boring. Um, so I know I won't be here towards the end because I have a couple other meetings in another building that I have to get to. So feel free to ask any questions along, uh, you know, during the talk that I do. Um, so feel free to do that. Um, just one thing is just wait for uh, the microphone to get to you uh, so that we can get the, the questions captured as well. So the, the things that I'm going to uh, cover with you today are, you know, wh why do we think smart clients are important uh, from Microsoft's standpoint? Um, the, the, the biggest thing to understand about today's talk in terms of the word smart clients is smart clients is not a technology. It's a, it's a concept. Um, and what we have is we describe smart clients, the problem space, why smart clients are very important, and really describe to you what assets we have as Microsoft that really make up the capabilities within a smart client solution. And you'll see some other re really compelling demos today about smart clients, what they mean to go back to the desktop, build applications that really know how to manipulate data and give you a very, very rich experience um, on the desktop. Um, cover what we call our smart client scenarios. These are typically the scenarios that we identify as being opportunities for ISVs, enterprises, and customers as they're building applications, utilizing one or all of the components that make up the, the technology assets that we provide for smart clients. Um, a technology overview, so we'll quickly go and look at each individual technology that we, that we deem make up our asset list um, to, to be able to build these uh, smart client solutions, as well as a roadmap to kind of show you what we have today and then what we'll have in the future so that there's kind of a, a following and understanding of what investments we make and what things we're carrying forward um, for, for future versions. So the best way to really start this whole thing out is by going right into a demo that illustrates, you know, from the beginning all the way going out to a device. We're going to start with a very, very simple web application, and we're going to eventually enable it uh, all the way out to a, a smart device. So I'm going to be sitting here. Keep getting these annoying wireless messages. So like I was saying, so this is uh, a very, you know, there's nothing wrong with this web page. It's, it's, it's actually a very nicely designed page. You can have uh, an, a, a good user experience in here. If I wanted to, I could go ahead and sort by addresses, sort by bedrooms, bathrooms, whatever I wanted to do. 
I could go ahead and filter down my list if I wanted to to say, show me everything with three bedrooms, one bath, that's $400,000. Nothing? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so there, so we took, just took that big piece of, uh, that big list of data and we actually went ahead and applied a very simplistic filter on this, right? So what am I doing here? I'm, I'm actually doing a bunch of round trips back to the server. You know, everything is, everything is running on my laptop right now. So I've got IIS and everything that I need to facilitate doing this demo. So the problem with this experience is the fact that, number one, I need to be connected. So I can't take any of this data with me. Um, this whole demo revolves around a, a real estate company. And thinking about it as a real estate agent going out into the field to try to get some work done. The thing is, is that if they're not connected via Wi-Fi somewhere, they're not going to be able to do anything. So, you know, you still have a lot of nice capabilities within this web page. So if I'm connected and there's a particular property I want to look at, I can go ahead and select the property. I can get a nice little static map and an image of the property and some details about it. But, you know, if you really want to begin to enable people to be a little bit more productive as well as take up less bandwidth in terms of building these types of solutions, you know, I'm going to make a very, very simple change to, uh, to the solution. The first thing to point out is on this machine, I actually have three versions of the .NET framework running. So I have the 1.0 version, the 1.1 version, and the 2.0 version. So right now, this page that you're looking at is utilizing the functionality that's provided through the .NET Framework 1.1 version. So now what we're going to do is make a very, very simple change to this one line of code. And the most important thing about this line of code is this, this element right here, which says the .NET CLR 1.1. What I'm doing by, by commenting out this line of code is I'm actually telling ASP.NET to say, what's my real user agent and what things can I really take advantage of that are on this client, right? So on this client, I have three versions of the framework, each one building upon, upon the other in terms of functionality, controls, things of that nature. The 1.1 version, what you saw was a very, very simple you know, grid, we could apply some stuff, but it always kept round tripping me. I always had to go back to the server. So by commenting out this line of code, I'm now going to say, if my user agent contains the CLR 2.0, then let's do something different. Let's provide a native control inside that web page so that we can make the experience a little better, as well as reduce the amount of round tripping back to the server. So once we pull the data to this page, we're going to be able to interact with it immediately and not have to go back, retrieve more data, and constantly be doing this in terms of filtering and things of that nature. So save that page. Go ahead and refresh. Take one sec. Two, three. Trust me, it's working. Right now, what it's doing is, so when it went back to the server, ASP.NET said, okay, I'm delivering this to what? What user agent are you, are you providing to me? Well, my user agent string actually contains the .NET, 2 .NET CLR 2.0 in the user agent string. So the piece of code that I commented out is actually looking at that and saying, oh, hey, he's running the 2.0 framework. Let's provide him a nice grid control that he can be able to use and interact with the data. So essentially what it's doing is it's loading the control, loading the data from the database, and then it's going to provide that data to me in the web page. Uh, MSDE. So I'm running just the, just the desktop developer edition of SQL Server. God, you love, I just love demo hell. So... It finally came back on the other page as well, I believe. No. But, so all I did was recall the page again. So this is essentially the same page um, that now, as you can see, it's, it's the same experience. The only thing that we've done differently here is now I have a grid control. So this is part of the out-of-the-box framework 2.0.
Now, because I'm running the framework locally on my machine, the browser knows that it can load this control for me. It retrieves all my data for me. I still have all the same capabilities. I can go ahead and sort and filter things, um, all the same capabilities. But now, while I'm doing this, I'm not going back to the server anymore. I'm actually being very productive just sitting here and, and, and working with my data, filtering information as I want to. You still get the same static map and the same images and all that type of stuff. But now, when you really think about, once again, we're tied to a connection. Now, we want to enable people to be able to go out and do mobility type of work, right? So if I'm a real estate agent and I'm searching around and I'm driving and I see new houses are up for sale, or I know I have clients that potentially want to buy a house that's somewhere, really what I want to be able to do is, is use either my laptop or a tablet PC or a smart device or a pocket PC, and I want to still be able to work with my information. I still want to be able to service my customers, but without being connected. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this to the next level. So now we've seen a very simple web page. We've kind of enabled that web page to be a little smarter by retrieving data, caching it, using it. But now we want to be able to build a solution that these individual agents can take on the road with them, right? So I want to be able to be disconnected, have all my information, and, but still be very productive at, build, uh, at, at servicing my customers. So you'll see this. We have a little uh, graphic here that says, try our new premium, uh, premium experience. So as I click this, you'll see it's verifying uh, uh, some requirements of my machine to make sure I can be authenticated against uh, actually installing this application. So now what you're seeing is this dialog box, which is called application installation. This is a new feature of the framework 2.0, which is called click once. This is something that's coming in our code name product would be, which is Visual Studio 2005. So now I've built a smart client application already. I've deployed it to a web server, and now I want to go ahead and install this. Now, typically, when an end user is going to go ahead and install an application, they've got to go do a setup, they've got to make sure they have privileges, they've got to make sure that that, that application is probably going to be serviced from some IT infrastructure. But now, what we're enabling through ClickOnce is the fact that you can deploy it to a, web, uh, to a web server, you can deploy it to a file share, and then an end user can simply click on whatever you want to associate it to, whether it be an icon or whatever, and then it'll go ahead and take care of the installation for you. Not only will it install the application, it'll do an add, remove programs item, so you get all the great features that a normal application has by adding things to the program menu so people can find things, people can uninstall stuff very easily. So if we go ahead and say install this application, what it's essentially doing right now is it's installing it, doing my add, remove program items, adding my uh, icons to my start menu, Uh, when you go ahead and build a, a smart client solution using click once, you have all the capabilities in the framework. So if you wanted to set up group policies um, that might apply to your enterprise or to the types of solutions that you're developing, there's a lot of different ways that you can control the granularity of, of the security constraints of what you want to happen. Right? So people might be able to install the application, but might maybe not be able to use certain portions of the application. So there's a lot of different capabilities that you have using the framework and all of the policy editing tools that we provide uh, as, as part of the framework as well. So the, the first thing you see here up in the uh, corner is basically a dialog box that's indicating that we're, we're basically going offline. So for demonstration purposes, we've, we've kind of designed this application to go immediately offline. So what we do is we download all the data, we cache all the data, and then we basically tell the user, hey, you downloaded this at this particular uh, timestamp, and these are all the records that you have. Um, so now you have your information. If we click OK, we'll now begin to bring up the smart client application. You can already see that the application is just quite a bit different, right? So this is a, a true client application. You know, these are the, these are the web pages behind. So, you know, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really using a, a true desktop application when I'm interacting with this data now. The experience is much richer, 
Um, you know, I still have the grid. I still have all the capabilities of sorting and filtering. Um, and there's lots more detail that we have now that we can work with this data. So if I'm, imagine if I'm sitting in my car and I'm about to go meet one of my clients. Look at the amount of information that I have now with me while I'm sitting in my car disconnected. Right? Now, if I was still using those web page solutions, I would not ever be able to have this level of detail. Now, the interesting thing is this piece over here is MapPoint. Now, there's two ways you can implement MapPoint. In this particular solution, MapPoint's actually physically installed on my machine, and I'm just using the APIs to interact with MapPoint directly so that I can go ahead and identify the properties. So you can see, you know, I have all the richness of, of being able to use MapPoint um, while I'm sitting somewhere. Um, so, or if I, ha if I would have a connection, I can use all the MapPoint web services if I wanted to. So there's all kinds of different capabilities, you know, by moving back to the desktop and using some of the rich capabilities of either our products that you can integrate with or through any web service that's sitting out on the internet. You know, some of them, the web service pieces, they're a little bit connection dependent because you're going out, Wi-Fi, whatever, to go ahead and retrieve information. By using this map point locally, I now have all the rich interactions of the properties and different things of that nature that I can look at. Now, the other thing is, is that you know, on a web page, you're really designing uh, applications that require a certain amount of scrolling. Uh, regardless of how well you design your web applications, there's still some element of, I need to scroll to get to my information. By designing the application the way we have, you really don't have to scroll around. We have tabbed infrastructure so that we can go to multiple different areas of the application, as well as the fact that if I wanted to, we have the capabilities of building drop downs. So now I have a drop down where I can begin to say, show me all the houses that I want to pay $3,380 uh, $3, a month to. I can go ahead and begin, you know, saying, show me all the five bedroom houses. Obviously, I always keep picking the ones that don't exist. So these are all the ones that are up to four bedrooms. So now I'm able to filter my information very easily now. I can close that. I can go ahead and pick different properties, and now I have the same, same level of information. I can see additional pictures and things of that nature. I can see exactly where the property is on the map, so we have a, a good idea of possibly what's surrounding it, schools, different things of that nature that your clients are going to be so interested in. You would never be able to do that in a static web-based application. By doing this, you're building a very rich experience for anybody to be very, very productive and, and really kind of up the level of customer satisfaction for the people that they're servicing. Now, typically, you know, this is a great application. I could probably sit down with my client and say, hey, these are all the houses around me. These are all the different things that, uh, you know, I can, I can tell you about, all the prices of the properties. But now, imagine if your client sits there and says, that's the house I want. Uh, let, let's just make an offer right now. Um, I, want, I want to be able to make an offer and buy this piece of property. So what we did as, as part of, uh, of this application, we built this application using Windows Forms technology. But when you're building some type of offer letter or a contract, typically you're going to be using a word processing tool. So what we did is we integrated um, a, a few elements of Office inside the solution. So because I'm sitting there and I say, I want to go ahead and make an offer on this house. So there's the house that I want to make an offer on. I can go ahead and look at the task pane, which is everybody familiar with the task pane with inside of Office? So within the task pane, you have the capabilities now with Visual Studio 2005 to basically build applications with inside of Office. So that task pane is a custom developed task pane using Visual Studio tools for Office. So if I wanted to, watching the document, these are all my properties that I have access to. As I update a property, my document updates with all the information about that particular property. I can go ahead and see who the buyers are. So I have all the information about my customers. I can go ahead and look at the different financing principles of this particular thing. So as I begin to, to go down and add information via the task pane, my document's automatically updated. 
And the most interesting thing about this document and really what we're enabling is what most people don't really think about is this submit button, right? So within this document, I've now associated controls. These are managed controls from the .NET framework. So within Visual Studio now, with the, with the upcoming release of Visual Studio 2005, we bring in Word, we bring in Excel into the IDE. So now it becomes just another design surface. So just like you can build a Windows Forms application, we now allow you to build applications on, side of, on top of Excel, on top of Word's canvases. So that is actually a managed control that I just clicked. Now the thing is, is that typically within a word processing tool, you're going to think about faxing, printing. Well, by being able to put controls like this on the documents or on spreadsheets, you now have the capability of taking control of what you want to do with that document and that information. I could fax it, email it, I could send it to a web service, I could do a number of things. Along with the capabilities that we really provide within Office in terms of information protection, you know, DRMing, being able to actually lock the document if you want to digitally sign the document. There's a, so many different capabilities that we're really providing by building a smart client application, integrating it with elements of Office. Now, the next thing that we really kind of think about is in terms of real estate uh, agents. They're not always going to have a laptop. They're not always going to have a tablet PC. They're not always going to be in their office to get information. So what we want to be able to do is take this same level of information and provide it to them in, in some form factor that they can still work with while they're out doing whatever. Dinners, lunches, they need to be you know, given the information so that they can begin making business decisions, contacting clients, different things of that nature. Real estate's a very competitive world, so we want to be able to give that edge to people. So what we'll do is close these down. So now what I did earlier was I've already deployed, I've already deployed this solution uh, to a, a device emulator. So as part of Visual Studio 2005, the fact that you made an offer propagate itself to the online database at some point. Yeah, so in this example, right, we really don't show, you know, how you're going to do resolution, right? How you're going to do, uh, how are you going to deal with, you know, uploading the data, things of that nature. Now, you can certainly build all those capabilities within this, right? So if you wanted to say submit offer and it actually cached that information locally, the next time that you, it senses a Wi-Fi connection or whatever, it basically a business process could kick off, take that information, upload it into your database, we didn't really provide that level of prescription in this, in this demonstration, but that's something fully capable of doing. You know, in that submit button, you could even, you know, take that, put it into isolated storage locally. When it connects, you know, go ahead and, and kick off whatever else, other processes that, you know, your organization might require. So right now, what, the, what we offer in terms of, of handling, so we have a, a whole bunch of these things that are called blocks. And uh, they're part of uh, the uh, prescriptive architecture guidance that the developer and platform evangelism group provides. These are all readily available in MSDN. So some of the capabilities that you're seeing, like click once, for example, is, it's a great example because when we originally went ahead and you know, built the .NET Framework 1.1, you know, we had XCopy deployment, we had what's called no touch deployment. Well, click once is an evolution out of part of the work that the patterns and, pract uh, and practice group did. So you can kind of see we build these prescriptive guidance uh, pieces of, of, of code, white papers, architecture, everything about building a particular element of the solution, right? And then what happens is because we're part of the developer division, these things really get consumed and placed into the products. So click once is a great example of one of the, one of the uh, PAGs that we have. 
and how it's melded into the, our actually product suite now. Now things like offline, so when you saw that originally come up and it says now you're in cached mode, um, now you're offline, well we provide once again another application block that's called the offline block. So that goes into describing the architecture, coding techniques that you should, uh, you should be dealing with in terms of concurrency, data collisions, all those different elements. So we provide application blocks on a number of smart client topics. Deployment, um, security, like uh, what you were asking before about uh, group policies and things of that nature. We provide so many different application blocks that are really geared around smart clients, um, even going down to mobile devices. So, uh, when, when you cache the data, you cache the entire database on your smart client, or can you selectively cache something? Again, in this demonstration, it's a very small number of records, so we just went ahead and cached everything, and it's actually cached in isolated storage. So it, it carries with the user, um, but if, depending upon what you want to do, caching-wise, um, there's a lot of different things that you could build. Um, you know, you could sense the amount of bandwidth that you have and say, only bring down the relevant records. Um, you, could, you could build an interface that would allow a real estate agent or an end user to go ahead and selectively download what they want to download. Um, it really is, it's a case of what you want to do within your organization. Um, and the interesting thing is, is I've given this talk and this demonstration quite a bit, and these are great questions, but you can kind of see what smart clients begin to make you think about. Um, and, and how you can build the applications to, you know, I hate to say it, but e be even smarter about bandwidth utilization, uh, what kind of data, um, if I know something about the individual that's running on that machine, what kind of information can I bring down automatically for them? You know, that's, that's the whole concept of targeting. So what I did earlier uh, before I came to the talk was to, to deploy the application to the device. So you can kind of see it's a little bit hard. There's the icon for the device itself, or for the application that's running on the device. So I can go ahead and start that application. Now, thinking about I'm, I'm on a phone, so I want a form factor that's good. I don't have to scroll. I don't have to do a lot of manipulation. I can see exactly who all of my, who all the people are that are potentially my customers. There's our own favorite, uh, our favorite Soma. Um, I can go ahead and, and select Soma. I can go ahead and see the properties that he's interested in. So it's just another level of, of interaction and user experience that we're providing you know, to the very end user. I mean, we're going as far to the edge of the network as possible to leverage the interaction, provide competitiveness when you're building these types of applications. So thinking about people going and, and building so many web applications and doing such an investment in them you know, they're not really seeing the light of what they could be providing to their end users, whether it be within an office environment, within a client application, or whether it be on a device. You know, all of these things that I'm showing to you are all possible today with just all the tools that we already have. And we have a lot of new technologies coming in within Visual Studio 2005 that enable these scenarios and, you know, even more. So the, the last thing in the demo was, so, it's hard to see. Oh, it's all the way down at the bottom. <laughs> but the last thing of the demo would be to basically show how easy it is just to remove this application. So, these are all the programs that I have running on my, on my machine. And there's our smart client application that we installed. So, when I did that click once installation, it added it to my program menus and it added to the add remove program menu. So all I have to do is say, go ahead and remove this. Now the next thing you'll notice is that this dialog box is very similar to the installation dialog box. It's because this is all part of click once. When we do this, un this uninstall, click once is really taking back over to making sure it removes everything properly. And once that's removed, I no longer have the add remove program items or anything. Now the interesting thing about using click once as well is if you deploy the application, the next time that that end user starts that application up, it's going to go and check again to see if there's any updates to that application. If there is an update, it'll go ahead, download it, install it, and allow the user to begin using the latest version of the software. There was no calls to IT, there was no uninstall, reinstalls. You know, that's the way ClickOnce is really enabling the capabilities of 
awesome productivity because you're not dealing with installation issues, end user questions, things of that nature. So I'm going to hop back over very quickly. So I know I have, uh, I have a, a lot of slides, but we have other demos that we want to get up here. These are all going to be completely available, um, so you can download them and, 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 and go ahead and go through all of these. The really the important slides are, when we look at this kind of problem, what the demonstration that I did, really what we're looking at doing is in the past, IT and business have always been so disconnected. And really, you know, we see businesses having all these great strategy elements, and how do you connect all these things back together? And the thing is, is that using all these arrows, we're really building an ecosystem of information. Being able to use smart clients, you're actually, we've, we've kind of said to people in the past, build your business applications using web services. Well, the problem is, is that there's so many web services out there now, and there's so much information readily available, there's nothing to consume it. So that's where we're kind of saying in the business practice area where people are making decisions, collaborating with other companies, working with partners, this is where smart clients come in. This is the biggest bet you know, that we make in terms of client revolutionary technology to say, now build smart clients to consume all this data and begin analyzing it and actually making your businesses you know, a lot more efficient and better. Last mile problems. Smart client solutions, when we think about this, we think about like in this real estate demo. This is what we call an activity-based client, right? If I'm selling a house, show me all the capabilities for selling a house. If I work in the human resources department and I need to hire an employee, show me all the tasks associated with that. Don't show me 5,000 menu items, 50 buttons. Just show me a very task-oriented way of conducting my work. These are some great quotes about the whole fact that, you know, a new client revolution needs to happen. We've kind of hit the wall with browsers. Um, can you still develop rich browser applications? Absolutely. Um, is, the, is browsers dead? Absolutely not. There are places where browser technology is, is great. Um, but when you're working with lots of information, you know, you want to be able to give the rich user experience so people can begin manipulating, analyzing all the data in an interactive fashion. This is our great Venn diagram, coolest animation I've ever done. These are kind of the scenarios that I was talking about before. So for this past like two years, we've been working on lots of different case studies in terms of .NET technology and things of that nature. We bucketize these in the smart client world to talk about line of business integration. Around the demo that you saw, this is really what we would consider a line of business integration scenario. Web enrichment. The real estate demo is also about that, but the one, a great example of web enrichment is thinking about taking a, a site like eBay, right? eBay is the greatest, coolest thing is, you know, sell everything. I've sold tons of stuff on eBay, but you know what? It is super painful. There's so many click-throughs, and now you can build solutions using Excel to manage all of your lists in eBay. Now, it's all through web services, and you're actually putting it in a client that you're familiar with, easy to use, and everything is one fell swoop. One click, upload everything. And then mobility pieces. And the mobility is a the great example is, again, back to the demo that I did. It's enabling mobility on laptops, tablet PCs, pocket PCs, and smartphones. We try to get out of uh, allowing people to think that mobility means phones. Mobility is so much more than phones. And being able to you know, use the Wi-Fi capabilities that are being you know, implemented throughout you know, everywhere start taking advantage of some of those capabilities, GPRS, things of that nature. There's a little bit more details about the clients. Um, this is probably the, the most important slides are at the base, obviously, we're all Windows. Windows Server, Windows Client, and Windows Mobile. Everything we think about is integration through XML Web Services. Everything that we think about developing these types of solutions using Visual Studio. And then here's the great slide of, look at all the boxes. Now these are all the technologies that we believe make up our smart client assets. Things that you can develop in using ClickOnce, the Compact Framework, 
Visual Studio Tools for Office, developing office type solutions like I showed in the demonstration just with Word. Now the important thing is we break these down even further and we look at it from two angles, .NET and Office. Building .NET applications means you're building custom UI, you're integrating through web services, you're building an interactive and rich experience for people to be able to manipulate data. From the office side of the world, you're thinking about adding business logic to your documents, attaching schemas to your documents so you're validating information as you're entering it, um, providing solutions built on Office because we're installed in over 400 million desktops. Why not begin to give solutions to end users in an environment that they know how to use without putting them through tons of training and having companies reinvest in tons of training? We now have you know, add-in capabilities for Excel and Word and Outlook and InfoPath. So, and we're going to be extending those capabilities well into the future you know, throughout the office system. Now when we think about these two buckets of .NET and Office, we put them as Windows applications and device applications, that's pretty obvious. And from the Office side, we think about code behind smart documents. So the document that I showed you that has an attached schema to it and everything else, you're actually putting business intelligence behind your document. As I'm entering information, I'm validating it live. So there's no enter my information, save it, allow somebody else to check it, or do more data input on it. You have all the capabilities of being able to build those types of solutions within Office now, as well as looking at building extensibility solutions within Office through add-ins. So you can do add-ins for Excel and Word and InfoPath and Outlook. So you can begin thinking of expanding the types of solutions that you would de develop with inside of Office itself. We're very, very much thinking of Office now as not just simply a set of productivity tools. It's actually a platform to begin developing solutions against. These are the different types of solutions and further breaking them down even, even more. These are all the gratuitous marketing slides. A technology roadmap, once again, keeping with the, the ideas of separating .NET and Office. These are all the technology investments that we now have in the Now Wave, where we have Visual Studio Tools for Office 2003. We have some other technology called the Information Bridge Framework, which allows you to connect into Office through line of business systems using metadata and XML web services. And from uh, the now wave in, in the .NET time, you know, we still have Visual Studio.NET 2003, Windows Forms 1.0. Um, these are some of the application blocks for the updater block and the offline block, as well as the compact framework and the full framework. And we're just simply taking all of those capabilities and technologies and extending them into the future constantly building on them to make them more valuable assets for developers. Tons of resources in terms of smart clients, mobility pieces, smart clients, office. Um, the, the, the greatest asset that we have in terms of understanding all of the development technologies is using our developer center on, on MSDN. Um, once you go to that developer center on MSDN, it'll link you into a lot of these uh, as well as even more, even more uh, pieces of the technology uh, landscape that we that we provide. Q and A, which I think I probably answered a lot of people's questions. That's fine. I clicked you over. Whoops. You want this? Okay, this is um, going to be pretty much a blitzkrieg. Uh, we're coming down from a 25-minute presentation to a 15-minute presentation because we want to leave at least 15 for for Doug to talk. Um, so um, keep an eye on this. Uh, I'm going to run through slides, and I think you, you will never see a faster run through of slides than this, but I, I want to use the opportunity to actually get across some concepts. And then I guess the primary idea that I'd like to relate to this, uh, Rob Barker, Rob Barker? Yeah. Baker? 
Parker. Parker um, was talking a lot about a lot about the technology, maybe the finer, uh, the you know the higher resolution stuff. I'm going to speak at a much higher level in terms of implementation um, and how it would work. Um, but basically, for me, the smart client is this. We had the old days when IBM thought that everything should be on a server, and so you got all of your action off of a centralized server. Then we got into the PC DOS world, and you had an application set on your local system. Um, and then we had the net. So now what we have is an opportunity to take the best of both of those worlds. You have an application sitting on your your local system that is actually leveraging information that is 24-7, always fresh, and in, there's going to be a lot of reasons why you want to have data that's continuously fresh. And for us, in our part at NASA, we wanted to take the data that we have on the terabytes of data that are coming off of the servers that we have from, uh, our, from satellites onto servers, and we want to make that available. So we build an application that's a planetary visualization tool called Whirlwind. Um, next slide. What is NASA Whirlwind? It's a richly interactive 3D planetary visualization tool. We'll show you that. It's built on smart client architecture, and we're very thankful for the .NET programming environment because of the homework that Microsoft has done, we've been able to accelerate through our development process. The program you will see was actually built by a single individual. And uh, it's something that if you were building it in C++ and OpenGL, would have required 50 to 100 people. Um, the Google Earth took 30 engineers three years. This thing took one person a year. Um, we're building a portal for NASA data. And this integrates data from a variety of sources. Next slide. Um, we've got a lot of data. We're trying to get it made available to researchers, academia, and the educational industry for building things that are curriculum elements for the classroom. If we can give them some nice set of information, that should make it a lot more fun and productive. Next slide. The algorithms that we're using are optimizing the integration of seamless blending of multiple data sources. We'll show you how that's taking Landsat and it's ele taking elevation data and it's putting it together. This data is simultaneously coming off of multiple servers and then being incorporated inside of a tool. Um, next slide. It is uh, based on an API type of architecture, which means you can take this application without making a single change of line to the code, leverage it. One example is some Fortune 500 companies right now are building a dashboard to actually access their back-end database to show their supply chain activities in the context of the world. And you'll see what I'm talking about, why I'm saying that. So, and we'll, we'll show an example of, of, of when an unlimited functionality of an XML, so you can change all the buttons. You can change what the buttons do, just be an XML file. So again, you don't have to change the source code to actually make implementation. Next slide. This is the next slide. Um, and we're going to give you an example of this. This is uh, f uh, federally delivered information that's updated every 28 days. And all this is the flight traffic information. We're going to show you that in 3D. What it is, is just pointing at a website, pulling the information down, and putting it in the context of the real world. Next slide. Um, these are the kind of data sets that we're accessing. Landsat imagery, the blue marble is one set of the Landsat. Elevation data shuttle radar topography mission. MODIS is a special satellite that's collecting data, uh, collecting data every, the Earth at once a day. We're leveraging some special visualizations from the Scientific Visualization Studio at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. We're also leveraging, this is more satellite data that's being collected on a daily basis that you're able to go and get daily data for, let's say, maximum temperature, barometric pressure, ozone, for whatever date range you want, and run a full animation of that data um, in the context of the real world. We're also leveraging the data that's being delivered by Microsoft Terra server, which is some ortho imagery at a quarter meter resolution for metropolitan areas, but also one meter for the entire United States and 15 meter for the world. Um, and some boundary information for the National Atlas. Key element here, the distributed active archive centers is where all NASA is holding all of its satellite data. This is petabytes worth of information. What WorldWind is is a pipeline being built in to access that data and deliver it to the PC desktop. Next slide. This is what some of that data looks like. So you can, that's why we're addressing the research community, but we're also addressing education because this is where kids can learn about the world, but it's also where researchers can do real work with the kind of stuff that they're operating with at the upper 
graduate level. Next slide. Um, also planetary data, moon. Here's the, the other side of the moon, not the dark side of the moon, the other side of the moon, because we're always seeing the same side of the moon. And uh, obviously Mars. Next slide. <clears throat> There's a SpaceX agreement, just as an example of how excited some people are about this particular uh, vehicle, is the uh, SpaceX agreement to develop a 10th grade, 10-week uh, curriculum on the origin of life. Next slide. Uh, the UN is beginning to use WorldWind to start tracking uh, health information, whether it's a spread of uh, SARS, whether it's uh, the locusts moving through uh, Central Africa so they can actually uh, get ahead of it to see where its distribution is. Um, DOD, U.S. Agency of International Development is using this in Mesoamerica. Department of Defense is using this because they love having a desktop application that's free and open source so they can do whatever they want with it and look at their own data sets. Next slide. Um, it's, um, it's already being used by uh, presidents between a couple countries. This particular Six Wallow River happens to be the boundary between Panama and Costa Rica. And during flooding, it changed. They said, hey, wait a minute, where's our new boundary? So WorldWind was able to help them out on that. Next slide. Bunch of stuff where WorldWind's being uh, you know, demonstrated. Wired Magazine is one. But all these computer magazines, PC World magazines across the world, are distributing WorldWind in it at uh, a probably, this, S, this is about over a million copies of Whirlwind just via CD distribution, but we have one million copies of Whirlwind being downloaded from SourceForge every single month. Uh, next slide. Um, 100,000 new unique IPs per week uh, and 100 requests per second for imagery off of servers that uh, is delivering the data. Next slide. Um, what is the benefit of open source? It uh, allows you to do whatever you want to do basically. Um, it allows you to benefit from what all those things that are being done by other people in the open source community. So if you are leveraging this tool, you'll be able to take more advantage of increased functionality with time because people are adding to it. Next slide. Uh, we think it's establishing a standard for information delivery infrastructure uh, because of the standardized data sets that are part of an international standard committee uh, protocol for the data types, and in this case it's WMS, Web Mapping Services, uh, but we are also leveraging some other open standards for data delivery. Next slide. End. Okay. So now we get to see Whirlwind, and uh, I don't think we have a, a hardwire connection, and we're working off of a wireless, which isn't real fast, so we're going to be taking advantage of some cache data. But under normal circumstances, wherever you go, you'll be, you'll be accessing a server. You'll be pulling down higher resolution data. That data now resides on, excuse me, on your server. And it, uh, so the next time you access it, it's being going to real fast. So let's, you, you take us on a tour of where you want to go. It's like we're going to Mount St. Helens. Um, so this is where it blew out, and uh, we've got the vertical exaggeration cranked up a little bit, which is easy to do. You just hit one, two, three through nine, you can uh, cause the vertical exaggeration to go to that, that, that particular level. This is Landsat imagery. Um, next, uh, what else might we show? Oh, want to go to Bill Gates' house? Microsoft headquarters, that'll be good. So what Randy just did is clicked a button, and, and as a result of that, he's going to another server. Pull, or a, it could be the same server, but he's pulling down a different data set. And so really what you're seeing here is the base set of information to provide supposedly, hopefully, the compelling environment that's more engaging for the delivery of the kind of information that will engage children to be interested in science. So from this, we can actually go and access um, the NASA satellite days. You want it, is it, can we see a WMS server? So the nice thing about this is that if you want to establish a server containing information, you can. You just put it whatever data you want. It could be higher resolution data for the area of Argentina. It could be higher resolution data for the area of Italy. Whatever it is, 
that you want high res resolution data for, you put it up and then this tool would be able to point at that and actually access that information and, and deliver it. So local area connection next to unplugged. So okay, we can't look at it, but if we could, what we would see is a selection for data that is maximum air temperature, uh, barometric pressure, ozone, and you could select the date range that you were interested in, and then you could actually play that animation day by day showing the, the actual scientific information. Um, to be fair to Doug, I'm gonna, um, Oh, Randy's going to show some examples. This is what it would have looked like had we been able to bring it up. This is a still, but if we had been able to do an animation, you'd see the temperature changing over time um, with, you know, throughout the year. Um, and this is just an example of one. You can control the transparency of that so you could bring the earth more through. We have uh, boundary data. Here's, you know, cloud cover. Um, you could, what's fun is to take cloud cover, match it up with precipitation, match it up with barometric pressure, and then get the students to appreciate uh, the concept behind weather and how they're all related. Since I'm, I should have asked first, um, but I'll part with this, if you're a computer science faculty, this would be a great tool for you to actually play with with your students because they can take and add code to it and then get some fun results. And if they had something that was really productive in terms of a functionality. NASA, as part of the open source community, would love to receive that information, and then we would put that in our next release, and we'd be glad to be having our credits page, which would speak of the university and possibly the student group that actually built that part of the code. Um, but I guess the, the critical element is that this .NET framework that we are using has allowed us to actually accelerate through the development process so that if you as a researcher or you as an educator or you as a, a computer programmer using that, I think you're gonna find it very, very satisfying compared to the alternative. So uh, Microsoft, thank you very much. I think the other key part is that they're not only using the uh, CPU locally to do some prefetching and caching, but they're also using managed DirectX to do, the, uh, to do all the graphics. So the ability to get this is, uh, is just handled by the, by the system itself. It, 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 yeah, it, it's not an understatement to say that in some cases using DirectX and the .NET libraries have, versus C++ and OpenGL have saved us 100 times the amount of time it would take to actually have done the same thing in, that, in taking that avenue. So um, good work, Microsoft, on, on that. Um, yeah, thank you. And I'll save questions for the end, too, if there's any time. But, and Doug... I mean, excuse me, Greg, Greg's uh, been uh, generous enough to let me go first because uh, I guess you'll explain why. Do you have a pointer? Do you want a pointer? Let me push this one. Oh, you, you got one. Number two, I think, PC2. There we go. Oh, no, thank you. I built one there, thanks. Hmm. Okay, how do, you, how do you follow a presentation about Whirlwind? Um, okay, we're gonna try. Um, <laughs> Which is what I do, in fact. Um, so uh, thanks to Microsoft for inviting me to present uh, today. Uh, my name is Greg Quinn. I'm a principal investigator uh, in, a, in a small group, a very small group at the San Diego Civic Computer Center, um, where we're looking at desktop applications to manage data, and also we're looking at uh, mobile devices as well for data visualization and data management. Um, but today I'm going to talk about something called the Collaboration Notebook. And um, I'm going to talk about the issues of um, data overload that researchers have to deal with. Um, I'm going to talk about the collaboration notebook and how it provides um, a solution for that. Um, then I'm going to talk about the smart client development framework that it provides developers um, and, and then the future work. And uh, I'll 
um, attempt to uh, do a couple of demos uh, and, and uh, demonstrate it actually running. So uh, to misquote James Carville, scientific research is all about the data stupid, as, as we all know. And this is data that's locally generated. It can be data that's theoretical data, um, data uh, determined at the bench, archived data in uh, laboratory notebooks, um, data in, in legacy databases from collaborators both uh, in the next lab or in Timbuktu. Um, and in the last five to 10 years, what's become very important is data available from the internet um, from places such as NCBI. And the collaboration notebook originally um, was born out of a project called the Encyclopedia of Life. And um, when I was originally pitching the overall design for this project, I guess about uh, two or three years back at uh, SDSC, um, it's a project that provides researchers with a lot of data about protein sequences. And my feeling at that time was it's not enough to provide great data, we have to provide a means uh, for um, researchers to manage that data. Um, so as data providers, we do a great job in providing high quality data, but a, a far less good job in actually enabling researchers to manage that data. And it turns out it's not a problem just of the Encyclopedia of Life project. There are many, just in the biological domain, uh, there are many excellent uh, online data sites such as uh, XPSC, uh, NCBI, Protein Data Bank, which is also hosted at the San Diego Supercomputer Center and Ensemble. Um, also, there are really some excellent um, online uh, analysis services such as BLAST. And um, as many of you know, BLAST is a, an algorithm that, that will take a protein or a DNA sequence and uh, search a database very, very quickly and uh, it provides the data back to you. And uh, NCBI's uh, web service, uh, uh, web-based service, um, provides the data back in, in multiple different formats, but typically researchers will retrieve it in, uh, as a web page because it's easier to actually scan that and assimilate the output. Um, the problem with that is how do you meaningfully store that data? How can you search the data when it's on your, on your hard drive? So this leads to issues of data overload for researchers where they're being bombarded with data Yet paradoxically, at the same time, there may be data sources that they don't actually have access to, that they, or, or they may not even be aware of data sources that will be of use to them. Um, so the issues are, how do you meaningfully store the data? How can you repurpose it? So for example, you do a BLAST search, it returns a whole slew of protein sequences that match uh, your protein sequence. How could you, for example, do a protease map of that sequence easily from a web page? Well, you can't. How can you keep track of data? Importantly, how can you annotate the data that comes back? Um, so our solution for this was to develop a, a project called the Collaboration Notebook. And we have a, a whole list of uh, things that we'd like to implement with this um, uh, project. But at its, at its core, it's an application that has a database. Um, and this database stores information that is obtained from data sources that might be databases or other online uh, resources. And this data store can, can be shared with other users of the application to create a, a virtual database. And the sort of thinking behind this is that we're creating um, a connected research environment, kind of like Microsoft's uh, connected office, um, where a researcher at the bench is able to uh, readily access data, to uh, annotate data, to input data from the bench. They're able to share that with colleagues and they're able to export the data, for example, in reports and publications. Okay. Um, this is a schematic of the graphical user interface um, on the, I'll just walk out here, I have a laser pointer. Um, so over here we have a, an area that um, is, is allows you to drill down into data, it's actually a tree control. Um, a bit further down we have a listing of the smart clients that the uh, that the notebook can actually um, uh, house, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we have a graphic, or we will do, we don't currently, we'll have a graphic of the uh, other users of the collaboration notebook in a collaboration group. And then we have a fast search option. And this region on the right-hand side is where um, the smart clients that uh, developers create are embedded. And these smart clients can be created using Windows Forms, um, they can be created using um, Avalon, which is this uh, new paradigm for creating applications with uh, WinFX. Um, and um, uh, they can, they, we can also embed uh, applications. And uh, as Patrick was actually referring to, I, we've actually embedded the 
uh, whirlwind application in our, in our notebook, and we're able to utilize that. Um, yes, so um, all, this, all this really basically shows is that we can click on a particular smart client. It's loaded uh, into the application process. Uh, smart clients uh, are um, delivered to the notebook application through a, an NAP server. NAP means it's just short, uh, shorthand for notebook application. It really means smart client. Um, so this NAP server uh, pushes the smart clients out. It also ensures that they're kept up to date. So by Microsoft's uh, definition, could we, can we actually call these smart clients? Well, we certainly use local resources, so we can create an application that, that has great graphics because it uses DirectX. So uh, yes is the answer for that. Um, it's certainly connected. That's how we obtain our data. Um, it's offline capable. We have a, a data store in there that can store data. We can retrieve the data and view it. And uh, we have an intelligent me mechanism for actually deploying and keeping the uh, smart client updated. So uh, we, think it, we, we think it satisfies the criteria. Um, this is a, a schematic of the internals of the application. Um, what I really want to show here is that smart clients um, are developed uh, and uh, interface with the internals through a, an interface class. And this enables the smart client to, um, to access data through um, what we call service wrappers. And for each um, online service, for example, a SOAP service, or it might be uh, an Oracle database, there is a service wrapper that, that provides an interface uh, to the application, and the smart client is able to uh, obtain data from that. It's also able to uh, persist data into the local database. Um, so very briefly, because I know we're running out of time, um, so the stages in developing a smart client uh, for, for the um, notebook are uh, with Visual Studio, you create a Windows Forms or, or Avalon application as a control library. Um, you reference the notebook interface class, and also there's a data objects class that you need to uh, reference as well. Um, you need to write a wrapper for the online service that you're going to be, uh, the, the data service that you're going to be using. Um, and you, write, you need to write a data translator as well that basically takes the data that comes in, rips it apart, and converts it into a format that, that can be used internally, a canonical data format. And we will be providing uh, developers with a test harness, which is effectively a gutted version of the notebook application, um, but they can test their service wrapper and um, smart client. Uh, embedding a pre-existing application is very similar. You basically uh, create a, a class library project in Visual Studio. You add a reference to the uh, application that you're trying to embed. Now, I should say the application needs to be a .NET-based application. Um, and you use the Visual Studio object browser to determine what methods are available within that uh, .NET based application. And you need to be creative, as I'll mention in a second. Uh, and then, you, then, as with the other uh, uh, smart client, you add references to the notebook interface class and data objects. Um, and in this case, we're, we're looking at uh, what we might do to embed the WorldWind application of Patrick and, and uh, his group. And uh, we need to create a wrapper that basically uh, wraps the application. And uh, data is fed into the wrapper. It's then converted into a format that the application can handle. In this case, for example, we're taking latitude and longitude data. We're feeding it in. We're converting that into a whirlwind URL. We feed that into the system clipboard. And, and we make a call in, in whirlwind to actually pull the data from the, from the uh, system clipboard. And that's how we, uh, you have to be kind of creative when you embed an application because you're basically left with the methods that the application uses internally. Um, so some example NAPs, um, I'll go through this very briefly. We've, we've created Blast NAPs, uh, one for the Blast service to actually create a sort of unified interface. Uh, we've created one for the, um, an application that is used for, used a great deal for um, microarray data analysis. Um, and finally, we, we've embedded Whirlwind. So I'll quickly uh, shoot through this, actually, and I'll uh, shoot to the demo. I can't read it. <laughs> Five minutes. OK, thank you. Um, so this is, um, so, in, in, so, with, um, so with microarray data analysis, we're, we're basically, uh, we created an application using the um, uh, uh, Avalon mechanism, where we use XAML to uh, determine the user interface and C Sharp for the business code and back. Um, the application, the smart client microarray application, 
runs within the notebook and it accesses the bioconductor package, but at the same time is able to persist data in the uh, notebook application database. Uh, and that's the, that's the interface for that. So I'll shoot through this. Um, so currently we have smart clients under development for the protein data bank, as I mentioned, that's, uh, that's currently being housed at the San Diego, San, San Diego Supercomputer Center. Um, also a major project at SDSC is the next generation biology workbench. And 50% uh, of my time is, is actually um, scheduled for creating a smart client for that. Um, other ones include, um, that we're dis in discussions about include the NEON project, which is for ecological surveying, and also for Homeland Security projects. And this is uh, an overview of the um, uh, roadmap we have. Um, we have a one day workshop planned in October, if anyone is interested. Um, Please uh, send uh, an email to notebook and stsc.edu and you'll be put on an email list. It's a read-only list, so you won't be spammed with information and uh, the, um, uh, the notifications are fairly few and far between. Um, I, sh I, I couldn't leave without uh, giving a huge vote of thanks to my lead programmer, Blair Jennings, who really from, has from scratch created the application and the internals uh, for, actually, uh, the, for the notebook to actually, be, to actually run. Uh, we've had uh, tremendous help from other people at SDSC, including Bob Burns, who created the microarray uh, interface, uh, Martin Dukoski is my REU student, and Kevin Fowler is working with me at the moment um, to try and port the code to the Apple Macintosh via Mono. And uh, from Microsoft, a uh, huge thanks to Dan Fay and Microsoft Research for seeing some merit in the project initially, and we're funded uh, for two years to do this. Uh, to Mark Miller for really smoothing the pathway for making this possible at the SDSC side, and for the good folks at the Synthesis Center, which uh, is the group that uh, is the umbrella group for uh, the uh, collaboration notebook. So um, before I launch into questions, I'm just going to give a quick demo of the application. Actually, if anyone has any questions while this is booting up, uh, please feel free to fire away. Okay, so. If we um, start up the BLAST interface on this, um, so we've tried to create a, a unified BLAST interface. Uh, dynamically, it's pulling down the uh, potential databases that it can search from uh, online sources. Uh, if I feed the uh, BLAST interface with a, a sequence that I know, it will find a result for this as a yeast protein sequence. And if I search, for example, an STSC protein data bank and also the local one actually running on this uh, computer, I'll go ahead and search. It should do the search fairly quickly and it will list uh, the fact that, yeah, okay, so we have a result back from STSC and we have a result back from, uh, from the local uh, computer. And we can see that in, in, the, in a, uh, a blast view here where the data is aligned. Um, I want to show you also WorldWin embedded. Um, I've putting this up in the, in the second instance of the application just to make sure uh, that it works properly. Okay. So first I'm going to uh, open up a, a data, inter data input interface. I'm going to load some data. Okay, this data comes from uh, Berkeley University, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, and it relates to where their specimens have been found. So I can go ahead and select one of the um, one of the uh, entries here, and I can ask it to be ask it to analyze it. And it's cranking up Worldwind right now. Okay. And it's going through to the particular place in Worldwind where, on the Earth planet Earth rather, that the um, uh, specimen was actually found. It zooms in. So it's basically uh, feeding data into Worldwind. Worldwind is, is then acting accordingly. So that's, that's 
pretty much it. Thanks for your time. was the ability to actually create compelling applications and actually great user interfaces for experiences actually also for the scientists and for other folks rather than the current interfaces and activities that they currently or applications they currently use. So utilizing tools and, and building off tool sets like these and even using the other tool sets that Rob uh, showed you know, can enable some of this very quickly and as uh, Patrick had mentioned you know, with very few resources. So. Um, one of the things we're interested in, and both through the RFP as well as through um, just applications in general, is people looking at some of these ideas, trying the, these out with regards to scientific applications and seeing what works, how they can make compelling applications uh, and actually speed up the use of scientific uh, discovery rather than spending a lot of time on those folks actually having to create uh, uh, interfaces. So if there's any other no questions, then uh, we'll finish up. Thanks.